Our Lady of the Flowers by Jean Genet, page 176. One night on the boulevard she met Sek Gogi, the big sunny negro, though he was only the shadow of the archangel Gabriel, was on the make. He was wearing a grey worsted suit that clung to his shoulders and thighs, and his jacket was more immodest than the form-fitting tights in which Jean Bolin garbed his round balls. He was wearing a pink tie, a cream-coloured silk shirt, gold rings with fake or real diamonds. What does it matter? He had extraordinary fingernails, long and dark, and at the base, as light as sound-year-old hazelnuts. In a trice, Divine was again the Divine of eighteen, for she thought naively, though vaguely, that being black and a native of a warm country, Gogi would be unable to tell her age or perceive her wrinkles or wig. She said, My, my, so here you are. Oh, I'm delighted. Sek laughed. Mm, pretty good, he said. And you? Divine stuck close to him. He stood firm and straight. Though leaning slightly back, motionless and solid, in the position of a kid who braces himself on his nervous knees to piss against nothing at all, or in the pose in which you will recall Lou discovered Alberto, Colossus of Rhodes, the most virile pose of sentinels, thighs spread, and their bayonet guns, which they grip with both hands, planted smack between their boots, right up to their mouths. What have you been doing? Playing the sax? No, I'm through with that. I'm divorced. I dropped banjo, he said. Really? Why? Banjo was rather nice. Here Divine got the better of her good nature. She added, mm, teensy bit plump, a trifle round, but really, she had such a good disposition. What about now? Gogi was free that night. In fact, he was looking for customers. He needed money. Divine took the blow without flinching. How much, Gorgi? Five louis. It was precise. He got his hundred francs and followed Divine to the garret. Negroes have no age. Mademoiselle Adeline could explain to us that when they try to count, they get all mixed up in their calculations, for they are quite aware that they were born at the time of a famine, of the death of three jaguars, of the flowering of the almond trees, and these circumstances mingled with the figures make it easy for them to go astray. Gorgi, our negro, was vital and vigorous. A movement of his back shook the room, the way Village, the Negro murderer, shook his prison cell. I have tried to recapture in the cell where I am now writing the odor of carrion spread by the proud-scented Negro, and thanks to him, I am better able to give life to Sekogi. I have already spoken of my fondness for odors, the strong odors of the earth, of latrines, of the loins of Arabs, and above all, the odor of my farts, which is not the odor of my shit, a loathsome odor, so much so that here again I bury myself beneath the covers and gather in my cupped hands my crushed farts which I carry to my nose. They open to me hidden treasures of happiness. I inhale, I suck in, I feel them, almost solid, going down through my nostrils. But only the odor of my own farts delights me, and those of the handsomest boy repel me. Even the faintest doubt as to whether an odor comes from me or someone else is enough for me to stop relishing it. So, when I knew him, Clément Village filled the cell with an odor stronger than death. Solitude is sweet. It is bitter. One might think that the head should be emptied there of all past entries. Precursory practice of purification, but you are well aware, while reading me, that this is not the case. 
I was exasperated. The Negro cured me to some extent. It seemed that his extraordinary sexual potency was sufficient to calm me. He was as strong as the sea. His radiance was more restful than a remedy. His presence was conjuratory. I would sleep. Between his fingers, he would roll a soldier whose eyes are no more than two musical pauses drawn by my pen on his smooth pink face. I can no longer meet a sky-blue soldier without seeing him lying on the negro's chest and immediately being irritated by the smell of turpentine that mixed with his used to befoul the cell. It was in another French prison where the corridors on their straight lines, which were as long as those in a king's palace, wove and constructed geometrical patterns on which the gnarled prisoners, tiny in proportion to the scale of the corridors, glided by on felt slippers. As I passed each door, I would read a label indicating the category of the occupant. The first labels read, Solitary Confinement. The next, transportation. Others, hard labor. Here, I received a shock. The penal colony materialized before my eyes. Ceased to be word and became flesh. I was never at the end of the corridor, for it seemed to me to be at the end of the world, at the end of all, and yet it made signs to me. It emitted appeals that touched me, and I too shall probably go to the end of the corridor. I believe, though I know it to be false, that on the doors can be read the word death, or perhaps, what is graver still, the words capital punishment. In that prison, which I shall not name, every convict had a little yard where every brick of the wall bore a message to a friend, B.A.A. of Sebasto, Jacou of Topol, known as V.L.F. to Lucien of La Chapelle, an exhortation, a votive offering to the mother, or a scathing, Polo of Gyps Bar is a stool pigeon. It was also in that prison that the chief guard used to give each of us a gift of a small packet of coarse salt on New Year's Day. When I entered my cell, the big negro was putting blue paint on his little lead soldiers, the biggest of which was littler than his littlest finger. He would seize them by the thigh, the way Lou Devine used to grab frogs, and slap a coat of light blue over the whole body. Then he would put them down to dry on the floor, where they lay in great disorder, a tiny, irritating confusion, which the negro heightened by coupling them lasciviously, for the solitude also sharpened his lasciviousness. He greeted me with a smile and a puckering of the brow. He was back from the Clairvaux State Prison, where he had put in five years, and had been here for a year while waiting to be sent to the penal colony. He had killed his girl, then, having sat her down on a yellow silk cushion with little green tufts, had walled her up, arranging the masonry in the form of a bench. He was annoyed that I didn't remember the story, which you must have read about in the papers. Since this misfortune had shattered his life, may it serve his glory, for it is a misfortune worse than being Hamlet and not being a prince. I am Clément, he said, Clément Village. I used to think that his big hands, with their pink palms, tortured the lead soldiers. His round forehead, which was as free of wrinkles as a child's, Gaul would have called it mulibrial forehead, would bend over them. I'm making buck privates. I learned to paint them too. The cell was full of them. The table, shelves, and floor were covered with these tiny warriors who were as hard and cold as corpses, whose number and inhuman smallness created for them a peculiar kind of soul. At night, I would kick them aside, lay out my straw mattress, and fall asleep in their midst. Like the inhabitants of Lilypot, they tied me down, and to get loose, 
I offered divine to the archangel Gabriel. During the day, the Negro and I would work in silence. However, I was sure that one day he would tell me his story. I don't like stories of that kind. Despite myself, I can't keep from thinking how the narrator must have told it, and I feel as if it reaches me like a dress that has been handed down. Until, and besides, I have my own stories, those which spring from my eyes. Prisons have their silent stories, and so do the guards, and even the lead soldiers, which are hollow. Hollow? The foot of one of the lead soldiers broke, and the stump revealed a hole. This certainty of their inner emptiness delighted and distressed me. At home, there used to be a plaster bust of Queen Marie Antoinette. I lived right next to it for five or six years without noticing it, until the day when its chignon miraculously broke, and I saw the bust was hollow. I had had to leap into the void in order to see it. So, what do I care about stories of Negro murderers, when mysteries of this kind, the mystery of the nothing and the no, signal to me and reveal themselves as they reveal themselves in the village to Lou Divine. The church played its role of jack-in-the-box. The services had accustomed Lou to magnificence, and each religious holiday made him uneasy because he would see emerging from him some hiding place, the gilded candelabra, the white enameled lilies, the silver embroidered cloths. From the sacristy came the green, violet, white, and black chasubles, some of moire, some of velvet, the albs, the stiff surplices, the new hosts. Unexpected and astounding hymns rang out, among them the most disturbing of all, the Veni Creator, which is sung at marriage ceremonies. The charm of the Veni Creator was that of sugared almonds and wax orange blossoms, the charm of the white tulle, to which is added still another charm, more peculiarly possessed by glaciers. We shall speak of this later. Of the fringed armbands of children taking First Communion. Of the white socks. It was what I am obliged to call the nuptial charm. It is important to speak of it, for it is the one that transported the child Goulafoy to seventh heaven. And I cannot tell why. Over the gold ring, lying on a white linen cloth, on the tray, which he bears before the bride and groom, the priest makes the sign of the cross with four little shocks of his sprinkler that leave four little drops on the ring. The sprinkler is always moist with a tiny droplet, like Alberto's prick, which is stiff in the morning and which has just pissed. The vaults and walls of the chapel of the Virgin are whitewashed, and the Virgin has an apron as blue as a sailor's collar. Facing the faithful, the altar is neatly arranged. Facing God, it is a jumble of wood in the dust and spider webs. The purses of the usherette, who takes up the collection, are made of a pink silk leftover of the dress of Alberto's sister. But the objects in the church became more familiar to Coulefoy. Before long, only the church in the neighboring town could provide new spectacles for him. Little by little, it was abandoned by its gods, who fled at the child's approach. The last question he asked them received a reply as sharp as a slap. One day, about noon, the mason was repairing the porch of the chapel. Perched at the top of a double ladder, he did not seem to Coulefoy to be an archangel, for the child could never take seriously the wonderland of the image-makers. The mason was the mason. A good-looking fellow, too. His corduroy pants set off his buttocks and hung loosely about his legs. At his open neck shirt collar, his neck emerged from a bush of stiff hairs as a tree trunk emerges from the fine grass of the undergrowth. The door of the church was open. Lou passed beneath the rungs of the ladder. 
lowered his head and eyes beneath the sky, inhabited by a pair of corduroy pants, and slipped into the choir. The mason who had seen him said nothing. He was hoping that the kid would play some trick on the priest. Goulefois's sabbats rattled over the flagstones until he reached the spot where the floor was covered with a rug. He stopped beneath the chandelier and kneeled very ceremoniously on a tapestried prayer stool. His genuflections and gestures were a faithful copy of those made by Alberto's sister on this same prayer stool every Sunday. He adorned himself with their beauty. Thus, acts have aesthetic and moral value only in so far as those who perform them are endowed with power. I still wonder what is the significance of the emotion that rises up within me when I hear some silly song just as it does when I am in the presence of a recognized masterpiece. This power is delegated to us sufficiently for us to feel it within us, and this is what enables us to bear our having to lower our head in order to step into a car, because we lower it an imperceptible memory turns us into a movie star or a king or a vagrant, but he's another king who lowered his head the same way. We saw him in the street or on the screen, rising on the toes of my right foot and raising my right arm to take down my little mirror from the wall or to grab my mess tin from the shelf is a gesture that transforms me into the princess of tea whom I once saw make this movement in order to put back a drawing she had shown me. Priests who repeat symbolic gestures feel themselves imbued with the virtue not of the symbol, but of the first executant. The priest who at Divine's funeral mass imitated the sly gestures of burglary and theft was adorning himself with the gestures, spolia opima, of a guillotined second-story man. So, no sooner had Coulafoy taken a few drops from the basin of holy water at the entrance than Germain's hard brace and buttocks were grafted onto him, as muscles were grafted on a later time, and he had to carry them in the current fashion. Then he prayed, in pose and mutter, accentuating the bowing of his head and the noble slowness of the sign of the cross. Shadowy calls rang out from all corners of the choir, from all the stalls of the altar. The little lamp was gleaming. At noon, it was seeking a man. The mason whistling under the porch belonged to the world, to life, and Lou. Alone there, felt himself master of the whole works. He must answer the clarion calls, must enter the shadow, which was as dense as a solid. He stood up silently. His sabots moved forward and bore him with infinite caution over the tufted wool of the rug and the smell of the old incense, poisonous as that of old tobacco in a seasoned pipe, as a lover's breath, desensitized the fears that were born thick and fast with each of his gestures. He moved slowly, with tired muscles, soft as those of a deep-sea diver, numbed by the odor which pushed back the moment so artfully that Coulafoy seemed to be neither here nor now. The altar was suddenly within arm's reach, as if Lou had unwittingly taken a giant stride, and he felt himself sacrilegious. The epistles had fallen down on the stone table, the silence was a peculiar silence, a silence that was present. They squashed against the thick walls of the church, like rotten fruit thrown by children. Though they were audible, they in no way disturbed the silence. Kula! The mason was calling. Shh! Don't shout in church! The two cries made a huge crevice in the edifice of the silence the silence of cottages that are now being robbed. The double curtains of the tabernacle did not quite come together, and from the slit, as obscene as an unbuttoned fly, protruded the little key that keeps the door shut. Coulefroy's hand was on the key when he regained consciousness, only to lose it again immediately. The miracle, blood will 
blow from the hosts if I take one. Idle stories about Jews, about Jews budding into the holy species, stories of prodigies in which hosts falling from the mouths of children stain the floor and clogs with blood. Stories about simonical brigands had all prepared this agonizing moment. It could not be said that loose heart beat faster. On the contrary, a kind of foxglove, foxglove is known as virgin's finger in those parts, slowed down its rhythm and force. Nor that his ears buzzed, silence emerged from them. A wild silence. He had risen on his toes and found the key. He had stopped breathing, the miracle. He expected to see the plaster statues come tumbling down from their niches and crush him. He was certain they would. As far as he was concerned, it was already done before being done. He awaited damnation with the resignation of a man condemned to death, knowing it was imminent. He awaited it in peace. Thus, he acted only after the act had been virtually performed. The silence, it was squared, cubed. On the point of blowing up the church, of turning the things of God into fireworks, the cyborium was there. He had opened it. The axe seemed to him so outlandish that he was curious enough to watch himself do it. The dream almost collapsed. Lou Coulafoy seized the three hosts and let them fall to the carpet. They descended hesitantly, drifting like leaves that fall in calm weather. The silence rushed at the child, bowled him over like a team of boxers, pinned his shoulders to the floor. He let go of the cyborium, which made a hollow sound as it fell on the wall. And the miracle occurred. There was no miracle. God had been debunked. God was hollow, just a hole with any old thing around it, a pretty shape like the plaster head of Marie Antoinette and the little soldiers, which were holes with a bit of thin lead around them. Thus, I lived in the midst of an infinity of holes in the form of men. I slept on a mattress that lay on the floor, as there was only one bed in which Clement slept. I would watch him from below, stretched out, as on a bench on the stone of the altar. He would move only once during the night to go to the latrine, he performed the ceremony with the greatest mystery, in secret, in silence. Here's the story as he told it to me. He was from Guadalupe and had been a new dancer at the Viennese dreamland. He lived with his Dutch girlfriend, whose name was Sonia, in a little flat in Montmartre. They lived there the way Divine and Darling lived, that is, a splendid and casual life, a life that a breath might shatter. So think the bourgeois, who sends the poetry of the lives of creators of poetry, dancers, negroes, boxers, prostitutes, soldiers, but who do not see that these lives have an earthly tie, since they are big with terror. Early in May, 1939, there took place between them one of those typical scenes between whores and pimps, for the take had been insufficient. Sonia spoke of leaving. He slapped her. She screamed. She insulted him in German. But as the tenants of the building were very tactful folk, no one heard. Then she decided to get her valise, which was hidden under the bed. And she quietly began to gather her underthings, which were scattered about. The big negro went over to her. His hands were in his pockets. Stop that, Sonia, he said. Perhaps he had a cigarette in his mouth. She continued stuffing her valise with silk stockings, dresses, pajamas, towels. Stop it, Sonia. She stuffed away. The valise was lying on the bed. Clément pushed her onto it. She lost her balance. And as she fell back, her feet, which were still wearing silver shoes, flew up to his nose. The girl uttered a tiny cry. The negro grabbed her by the ankles and lifting her up like a tailor's dummy with a dazzling gesture, a sun-like gesture, swinging rapidly on his heel, he broke her head on the post of the little brass bed. Clement told the story in his soft Creole speech in which the R's are dropped. 
and the ends of phrases were drawled out softly. You understand, Miss Z. Jean? I hear her head there. Her head there smacked on the brass bed. He was holding in his fingers a little soldier whose symmetrical face expressed only foolishness and caused that feeling of malaise which we also get from primitive drawings, from the same drawings that prisoners carve on prison walls and scribble in library books, and on their chests, which they are going to tattoo, and which show the profiles with an eye and full face. Clément finally told me of the anguish in which he had been thrown by the wrath of the episode. The sun, he said, was coming through the window of the little apartment, and never before had he noticed a certain quality of the sun, namely malevolence. It was the only living thing. It was more than an accessory. It was a triumphal, insidious witness, important as a witness. Witnesses are almost always for the prosecution. Jealous as actors at not having top billing. Clément opened the window, but then it seemed to him that he had just publicly confessed his crime. The street came crowding into the room, upsetting the order and disorder of the drama so that it could take part in it too. The fabulous atmosphere lasted quite a while. The Negro leaned out the window at the far end of the street. He saw the sea. I do not know whether, in attempting to reconstitute the state of the mind of the criminal who surmounts the disastrous horror of his act, I am not secretly trying to ascertain what the best method will be, the one most in keeping with my nature, in order not to succumb likewise to horror when the time comes. Then all the possible ways of getting rid of Sonia occurred to him at once grouped, interlaced, crowding each other, offering themselves to his choice, as on a street stand. He did not remember ever having heard about walling up a corpse, and yet this was the means he felt had been singled out before he chose it. So I locked the door. I put the key in my pocket. I took the valise from off the bed. I pull back the blanket. I put Sonia in bed. Funny thing, Miss e. Jean. Held Sonia there. Blood stuck on her cheek. And then there began that long life of heroism, which lasted an entire day. By a powerful effort of will, he escaped banality, maintaining his mind in a superhuman region where he was a god, creating at one stroke a private universe where his acts escaped moral control. He sublimated himself. He made himself general, priest, sacrificer, officiant. He had commanded, avenged, sacrificed, offered. He had not killed Sonia. With a baffling instinct, he made use of this artifice to justify his act. Men endowed with a wild imagination should have in addition the great poetic faculty of denying our universe and its values so that they may act upon it with sovereign ease. Like someone who overcomes his fear of water and the void, which he is about to enter for the first time, he breathed deeply, and bringing himself to a point of icy determination, he became insensible and remote. Having gone through with the irremediable, he resigned himself to it and came to terms with it. Then he tackled the remediable. As of a cloak, he divested himself of his Christian soul. He sanctified his acts with a grace that owed nothing to a God who condemns murder. He stopped up the eyes of his spirit. For a whole day, as if automatically, his body was at the mercy of orders that did not come from here below. It was not so much the horror of the murder that terrified him. He was afraid of the corpse. The white corpse disconcerted him, whereas a black corpse would have disturbed him less. So he left the apartment, which he locked with extreme care, and went off at daybreak to a construction yard to get twenty pounds of cement. Twenty pounds was enough. In a distant neighborhood around the boulevard Sebastopol, he bought a trowel. In the street, he had regained his man's soul. He acted like a man, giving his activity a commonplace meaning, that of making a little wall. 
he bought fifty bricks and had them hauled to a street near his own, where they were left in a hired wheelbarrow. It was already noon. Getting the bricks into the apartment was quite a job. He made ten trips from the wheelbarrow to his home, carrying five or six each time and concealing them under a coat that he carried on his arm. And when all the materials were ready in the room, he returned to his Empyrean. He uncovered the corpse. Then he was alone. He set the body against the wall near the fireplace. His plan was to immure it standing up, but it had already curled. He tried to straighten the legs, but they had the hardness of wood and had assumed their final form. The bones snapped like a bunch of firecrackers. So he left it squatting there at the foot of the wall, and he set to work. Works of genius owe a great deal to the collaboration of circumstances and workmen. When his job was done, Clement saw that he had given it, with marvelous exactness, the form of a bench. That suited him. He worked like a sleepwalker, preoccupied and determined. He refused to see the gulf in order to escape from dizzying madness, the same dizziness which later, a hundred pages later, Our Lady of Flowers did not resist. He knew that if he flinched, that is, if he relaxed that attitude, an attitude as severe as a bar of steel, he would have sunk. Sunk, that is, to run to the police station and melt it into tears. He understood this and kept repeating it to himself as he worked, mixing exhortations with invocations. As he told the tale, the little lead soldiers ran rapidly between his light fingers. I paid close attention. Clement was handsome. You know, from Paris Soir, that he was killed during the jailbreak at Cayenne. But he was handsome. He was perhaps the handsomest Negro I have ever seen. How lovingly I shall caress with the memory of him, the image I shall compose, thanks to it, of Sec Gogu. I want him to be handsome, nervous and vulgar. Perhaps his destiny heightened his beauty, like those silly songs to which I listen here in the evening and which grow poignant because they reach me across cells and cells of guilty convicts. His faraway birth, his dancing at night, his crime, were elements which enveloped him in poetry. His forehead, as I have said, was round and smooth. He had laughing eyes with long, curved lashes. He was gentle and proud. In a eunuch's voice, he would hum old songs of the islands. Finally, the police got him, though I don't know how. The little soldiers continued their work of invasion, and one day the foreman brought the soldier that was one too many. Village whispered to me, I've had enough, Miss Jeanie. Look, another soldier. From that day on, he grew more taciturn. I knew that he hated me, though without my being able to understand why, and also without our comradely relations suffering thereby. He began, however, to manifest his hatred and irritation by all kinds of acts of petty meanness, about which I could do nothing, for he was invulnerable. One morning, after waking up, he sat down on his bed, looked around the room, and saw it was full of stupid-looking figurines that were lying about everywhere, as mindless and mocking as a race of fetuses, as Chinese torturers. The troops rose up in sickening waves to attack the giant. He felt himself capsizing. He was sinking into an absurd sea, and the eddies of his despair were sucking me into the shipwreck. I grabbed hold of a soldier. They were all over the floor, everywhere, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. And though I was holding the one I had picked up in the warm hollow of my palm, it remained icy, without breath. There was blue everywhere in the room, blue mud in a pot, blue spots on the wall, on my nails, blue as the apron of the Immaculate Conception, blue as enamels, blue as a standard. The little soldiers whipped up a swell that made the room pitch. 
Just look at me. Clément was sitting on the bed and uttering sharp little cries. His long arms would rise and drop heavily on his knees. Women carry on like that. He was weeping. His lovely eyes were swollen with tears that ran down to his mouth. Oh, oh, oh. But I, here all alone, remember only the elastic muscle as he dug into me without using his hand. I remember that live tool to which I would like to raise a temple. Others were taken by it, and divine by Sek Gogi, and others by Diop, by Nicolo, by Smile, 